Uh, next lecture. So now, in the previous lecture, what did we do? We took everything we learned from 1D motion and we made new definitions uh, for 2D motion. So now we know how to talk about position, velocity, acceleration in multiple dimensions. And that resulted in us having to use vector notation in order to describe this. And so when we uh, next meet, uh, we actually will be playing around with a um, a web applet that allows you to say draw vectors and calculate their sums and differences uh, just to help you continue to develop a feel because uh, I imagine even if you took physics uh, in high school uh, the vector notation is likely new for you and it really becomes useful in this course definitely very very necessary in physics 3 so we want to build kind of an appreciation for how we think about these things using vectors. Uh, so we'll be doing a little bit of that uh, when we meet in person. But what I want to do now is to build upon these ideas and essentially just solve one particular problem today. And then lecture 11 is going to be, again, a lecture where I just do a bunch of examples from the end of the chapter. So the idea here is that we're going to think about the projectile. So by the projectile, I mean we're considering an object that is launched into the air at some initial velocity, which we know by me saying initial velocity, that means it was launched with some initial speed at some particular direction. Maybe it's straight up, maybe it's at, it's at an angle. Maybe it's I throw it down. You know, those are all examples of initial velocities with different directions. And we're going to study the motion of an object that when it's launched into the air and it experiences only free fall acceleration due to gravity. So the only thing we will be considering that is causing the object to accelerate or change velocity and therefore potentially change direction is the fact that gravity is pulling downward on the object or gravity is working in the vertical direction to cause the object to accelerate. So we are ignoring things like air resistance. We are ignoring anything else. We are ignoring what my hand is doing. We are considering the points in time between the moment the object, you know, just leaves my hand or the cannon or whatever it is um, as it sails through the air and to the point where it reaches the ground again. So this, there's a lot of intuition kind of built in with this, with this problem. Uh, you have dealt with projectiles all your life of just throwing things into the air, um, playing catch. All of these things are following the trajectory that you see when you do and study projectile motion, uh, where gravity is being experienced in the vertical direction, and there is nothing that is pushing or pulling or causing the object to accelerate in the horizontal direction. Which again would not be true if there was air drag, but we are going to uh, ignore that for this, for this problem. And so as I've teased, the idea that makes this problem uh, more approachable and easier to deal with um, is the fact that we can treat each dimension independent of the other. And why that's helpful here is if we look, for example, at an image of, say, a projectile, Oops. where maybe I have some axis I have a cannon that is located here and it launches a ball into the air in the positive x direction um, and the positive y direction. The projectile itself kind of goes out, reaches some top point and then comes back down, for example. And at any point along this journey, we could ask what are things like the position, the velocity, and the acceleration. So let me look at this point over to the right. You know, position I might draw as some, ob some vector that points from the origin to the location of the object, and I would call that position. That position is clearly changing with time as a result of the object experiencing some sort of, ex of velocity that is causing the object to move. The object is rising into the air, stops and falls back down. 
There is velocity associated with that because the object is going somewhere. But the velocity is not always the same. It's not moving at a constant rate. Sometimes the velocity is upward. Sometimes it's zero. Sometimes the, the velocity is negative as it falls back down. And that's just in the vertical direction. Then there's also it can be a component where it's moving horizontally as well. So the velocity is also changing. And in this case, with free fall, mo with free fall motion, what makes this easier is the only thing that's causing an acceleration in this case is the acceleration due to gravity, which points towards the ground straight down. Gravity cannot make this object move to the left or to the right. The only thing gravity can do is make this object move down if there's nothing in the way. Like my, if I remove my hand, gravity makes the object move downward. Gravity is the reason why the velocity slows down, stops, and then the, the object comes back down. Just by me tossing the ball up into the air, gravity is not making the object, say, move to the left or to the right. It is only working in the vertical direction. Gravity does not appear to influence what is going on in the horizontal direction. If I were to write this as a vector, for example, a... I might write this as zero comma negative g. The acceleration vector does not point in the horizontal direction at all. It only points in the vertical direction and it points downward. Uh, so we would write that as negative g. And what I'm alluding to here is that there is an independence of each dimension. What happens in the vertical direction does not influence or is not influencing what is happening in the horizontal direction. Each dimension operates independently of each other. So again, that's saying that if there is some horizontal component to the motion, like for example, I toss into the air at an angle. So it's not only going up and down, it's also moving to the left and to the right. What is, if I wanted to quantify, say, the horizontal velocity, how fast it's moving to the left or to the right, I can do that without having to take into account anything that's going on in the vertical direction. Since there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, I actually can say something quite simple about the velocity in the horizontal direction. Since there's no acceleration uh, pointing to the left or to the right, the velocity, once the object is in the air, retains its original value. Its initial horizontal velocity is the same horizontal velocity throughout. And we will actually write that down and prove that. But it all kind of works in with, with the assumption that each dimension operates independently of one another. And you might ask why? Do you have an argument for why each dimension operates independently of each other? So actually I don't either. But experimental evidence time and time and again have shown that the dimensions of space appear to operate independently of one another as long as you're using perpendicular coordinates you know x perpendicular to y horizontal and vertical what's going on in each is independent of each other what's happening in y does not influence x for example and we can see this uh, through some demos that we uh i would have done in class but i took videos with our uh, our lab tech uh, John Brockman, so shout out to him as well. So the idea here is that we're gonna first just look at a stationary cart. So let me actually just get the image up so you can see it. So the idea is that there is a little cart here on an air track. The air track allows you to move the cart at essentially a constant velocity. There's no friction, there's nothing that slows the object down. If I give it a push, it will, it will move at the same velocity 
as it moves along the air track because the air track is essentially creating a little it's it's making the object hover on a pocket of air just 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 above the air track um, kind of like an air hockey game you know the idea there is that the puck is actually hovering just slightly above the table uh, through the air that's coming through the table but first we're and so the idea is that it's constructed so that there's this little container that has a spring that can launch a ball into the air once it passes and there's a little switch on it that triggers the switch so that once it passes this little uh, black thing in the middle uh, that actually is a little has a little knob that as the cart moves by it it triggers the switch and launches the ball but first we're going to look at just what happens when you have a ball that is launched into the air but the cart itself is not moving and we're asking the question does the cart catch the ball In this case, he's going to release the ball, it goes up, and goes back down. We, do we need to say that again? Let's say that again. Cart's not moving, the ball is being launched straight into the air. It goes up, stops, comes down. Perhaps not too surprising here. Um, your mind might not be blown yet. Uh, and again, what's happening, it is launching the ball with some initial vertical velocity, which causes it to rise straight up into the air. It has no horizontal velocity, so it only goes up and down. But gravity has an acceleration on the object, so initially gravity is accelerating downward while velocity is moving upward. So remember from last lecture, we talked about how acceleration wants to pull the velocity vector to point in the same direction. So as a result, initially the velocity vector gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually it reaches that high point and then they point in the same direction and the velocity vector gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it speeds up on its path back towards the ground. So now we want to ask the question. We're going to do the same experiment again. But now we're going to allow the cart to move. So John is going to give the cart a gentle nudge at the very beginning. And when the cart moves and reaches that central point, it's going to launch the ball into the air. And the cart then continues to move. So the question is, does the cart catch the ball? I'll tease up to the to the point. So the idea is that the cart, long intro, the cart is going to move, it's going to be launched, it's going to move at a constant velocity. Initially, it's going, you know, eventually rather, it will get to this point where a ball will be launched into the air. You can see it's starting there. And the question is, does the ball fall back into the cart? Commit to an answer. You never have to tell anyone this answer. Well, fine. You, you can save this answer and tell on your deathbed you can reveal what you thought the answer was, even if you ended up being wrong. But just commit to an answer uh, right now. Yes, the cart is going to catch it. No, the cart is not going to catch the ball. Do it again. Ball is launched into the air. Falls back into the cart. Here's the same thing, but in slow motion. Cart approaches the switch. Ball gets launched ball now has some horizontal velocity so as it goes up and down like we've we kind of already understand but since it had some horizontal velocity because the cart was initially moving before the ball was launched into the air the ball launched into the air with a horizontal velocity and a vertical velocity but since the acceleration only acts in the vertical direction that horizontal velocity remains untouched. 
So as a result, the cart and the ball keep the same horizontal velocity the entire time. So while the apple does its thing in the vertical direction, they both move with the same velocity in the horizontal direction as a result, even when the cart is moving at a constant speed, the ball uh, is caught by the cart. The constant velocity component there is also key. If the cart, once, the, once it launched the ball, if the cart then tried to speed up, then they could become separate from one another. All right, and so, and then I have this example of something you can try to do on your own, uh, though I do not uh, claim any liability if this goes awry. Uh, again, by the idea that the um, trampoline is only causing them to move in the vertical direction and then gravity pulls them up and down. While well, they're all doing this on top of a moving car, so everything has the same horizontal velocity um, and they just can jump on the trampoline um, over and over, even though the car itself is moving. Though I guess they do have to be a little bit careful about air resistance. Um, though it seems like it's not making that big of a difference in this case. Anyway, I thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> All right, so the independence, so that is just experiments that demonstrate the independence of the dimensions. Again, I don't really have a proof of why this is true, um, but no experiment has yet to really um, disprove the idea that I can treat each dimension independently of one another. And so that is what we will do. It is supported by data, and we will move forward uh, with that as our validation. All right, so what are we going to do here? Let's set up a coordinate system where, again, I have something that is launched um, at the origin. And it's launched at some speed with some angle relative to the positive x direction. So it might go up like this, it stops, comes back down. And initially, there is some angle theta. I'll say it's theta naught that it's angled at. You think of that if it's a cannon, it's the angle the cannon is angled at when it launches the cannonball, for example. So the, the setup of the problem is that uh, some object is launched with some speed, which I'll write as the magnitude of the initial velocity. There's some initial velocity which points in some direction and has some magnitude, which is the speed. So it has some speed at some angle theta naught. Now how is the, can is the can pointing straight up? Is it pointing just horizontally? Is it at some angle? In this case, I think intuitively the idea is clear that what's going to happen is it's going to go up, it's going to stop, come back down, all while moving to the right or in the positive coordinate direction in this case. In 1D, we had written down that we could understand kinematic motion when there's a constant acceleration in terms of two expressions. We had that the final velocity equaled the initial velocity plus some acceleration times t. And then we had that the displacement or if you want to write another way, the final position equals the initial position plus two additional terms that take into account acceleration, velocity, initial velocity rather, and time. And again, the requirement was that the acceleration in this case must be a constant. And so when we were doing free fall motion, that acceleration was a constant of 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, there are other problems where the acceleration could be something different. As long as it's a constant, you're good. Uh, if acceleration is not a constant, these expressions have no utility. And the great thing now is that by saying that each dimension acts independently of one another, 
it essentially is just two 1D problems back to back. So in 2D, I can say each dimension has their own set. I can deal with the horizontal dimension independently of what I'm doing in the vertical direction. So for example, for 2D, and really I, I'm saying 2D just because that's the problem we're doing right now, but it could be you know, as many D as you want. So in 2D, I could say something about the X direction where I could say, for example, the displacement in the X direction is equal to the initial velocity in the X direction times time plus one half the acceleration in the x direction times t squared. And that v final in the x direction is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction time, um, oops, plus the acceleration in the x direction times t. Again, everything going on in the horizontal direction can be treated by itself, but you have to be careful with your symbols it only, you can only use numbers that are relevant to that dimension, the x dimension. And then similarly, I can say the displacement in y is equal to the initial velocity in the y dimension, plus one half the acceleration in the y dimension, t squared. And similarly, the final velocity in the y dimension is the initial velocity in the y dimension plus the acceleration in the y dimension times time. And solving them independently allows you to get the answer in both x and y. As a vector, I might write down this entire mess as just one single set of vector equations. So I might write down the displacement overall as a vector is equal to the initial velocity overall times t plus one half the overall acceleration t squared. Where again each of these vectors has an x component and a y component. And then the final velocity is the initial velocity vector plus the acceleration vector times t. This is the most concise way that we could write these expressions. And again, all it's saying is that you can treat each dimension independently of one another. Let me write that down another way. Um, just because I feel like the vector notation makes things appear more complicated than they actually are. So let's take the simpler of the two. So let me take this expression and write it out again in direct vector notation. But this time I'm going, I'm going to write it out using the column notation. So remember the column notation means the top line is the x direction. So that's saying the final velocity vector is the final velocity in the x direction in the final velocity in the y direction as a vector. And that is equal to the vector of the initial velocity in the x direction and the initial velocity in the y direction plus t, which is just a number, just a scalar, times the acceleration in the x direction and the acceleration in the y direction. So that vector notation, again, is just concisely kind of wrapping up the equations uh, but using vector symbols. And then if I wanted to look at everything on the right side of this, you know, so I'm looking at this part here, I could lump that together through how we know how to deal with vector addition. Vector addition just says I add the x components and then I add the y components. And so if you look at this, you notice by looking at the top line, and this is why I kind of like the column notation, particularly for projectiles, is that I can look at this and say that the final velocity in the x direction is simply just equal to, if I just follow the top lines of the vector of the column vectors, is just equal to the initial horizontal velocity plus the acceleration in the x direction times t, like what we saw with 1D motion.
And then similarly in the y direction, oops, I used too thick of a line. In the y direction, I just look at the, bo the bottom line of this column vector. And all that's saying is the final velocity in the y direction is equal to the initial velocity in the y direction plus acceleration times time. Again, a 1D kinematic equation, but I just write it out for, for each different dimension. Um, so a lot of people like this column notation, particularly for projectiles, when we're getting used to just thinking of it dimension by dimension. And then I could write down something similar for the uh, other kinematics equation. Uh, and again, it would just kind of result in the same expressions as what I wrote uh, up, up here. Um, but I would just be writing it in different columns uh, since it's just a vector. All right, so that is essentially it. So I'm going to work through kind of one example in gross detail now, and then again, the next lecture will just be me doing several other problems. So let's go back to the Canon example. Suppose it's launched at an angle of 30 degrees And you launch, you know, you launch a, a small ball at say at 10 meters per second. And again, the angle that you're making, it's a 30 degree angle above the positive x axis, which I should have defined. So that's x, positive is to the right, that's y, positive is to the right. Uh, positive is straight up. Then we could ask, for example, how long is the ball in the air? How far did the ball move in the x direction? How far away from the cannon is the start is the end point? Um, let me redraw this since I did not draw it. You know, suppose it comes up, comes reaches the top, comes back down. So there's some starting point here, which it looks like we put at the origin. We didn't have to, but we did. And then there's some end point here. So the question is kind of. How long is it in the air? That sounds like a time. And then there's also how far in the x direction did it go? So we're also asking something about displacement uh, in the x direction. Let's see, I'm actually at the bottom of a page. So I'm going to copy and paste this. we can see it. So how you approach problems like this, it's very similar to how we approach the 1D motion problems. Um, now we just have twice as many equations and twice as many symbols for 2D. Uh, so as like with 1D motion, I like to try to write down everything that I know first, ideally as symbols, and attach numbers to particular symbols if I know them. So let's see, what do I know? Do I know anything about dis the uh, displacement vector? And I'll stick with the column notation, though I could use any of the other notations as well. Uh, so again, this is just delta x in the x direction, delta y in the y direction. And I could ask, you know, what is the displacement between the start and the end point that I've drawn here? So in the x direction, I would say it's launched at the origin and ends up some position x away. So I might this is final position minus initial position. Um, and then in the vertical direction, it starts at zero, y equals zero, and also ends at y equals zero, 
it goes up and comes down along the way. But again, we're just looking at the start and the end point. So then this would be zero minus zero. So in this case, what I have here is the final position and zero, where this final position we do not know. It actually is one of the ones we're asked to solve for. Okay. I could ask, what about the acceleration vector? That one's not too bad, because again, we're looking at free fall motion. So I know there's negative g uh, in the vertical direction, because I've defined up as positive, so gravity is pointing downward or in the negative direction. And there's no acceleration that is occurring in the horizontal direction. Nothing is pushing or pulling the object to the left or to the right. Only gravity is working on the object once it leaves the cannon. So I would say it's experiencing no acceleration in the horizontal direction. And that's good because I know what g is. Uh, so, so far. So that's a variable I do have a number for. I could even write it down. g being 9.8 meters per second squared. So I could also note each component is a constant. Zero is a constant and then negative g are both constants. So what does that imply? That implies the 1D kinematic equations are okay to use uh, because in each dimension there's this object is experiencing a constant acceleration okay so in that case then if I know the kinematics equations are good I could look at what other symbols are involved in the kinematics equations because uh, I have a hunch that they might be useful here and I could ask, what else uh, do I know? Or could I calculate? So let's think about the initial velocity. I'm told that the object is launched at an angle of 30 degrees with some initial velocity equal to 10 meters per second. Or sorry, some initial speed equal to 10 meters per second. But since we're dealing with vectors, it'd be nice if I could write this as both what is the x component and what is the y component of the initial velocity vector. Because that initial velocity is pointing a little bit in the horizontal direction, and it's also pointing straight up, which is why the object ultimately goes up and comes down, all while also moving to the right. There is some initial horizontal velocity and some initial vertical velocity. So that was, I think, two lectures ago now at this point, where I have some initial velocity v. There's some angle here, which is 30 degrees. And now the question is, what is the initial horizontal velocity and what is the initial vertical velocity? We have enough information here to figure that out by clever Sokotoa rules, I can write the initial horizontal velocity and the initial vertical velocity in terms of the speed, which I know, and the angle, which I know. So then I can get actual numbers for these two. So in this case, I get that the horizontal component is 8.66 meters per second and the initial vertical component since sine of 30 is a half is just 5 meters per second. So in this case I can write, you know I kind of wrote it that way already but I'll rewrite it again. You know I could write the initial velocity as a vector is the same thing as the initial velocity in the x direction, the initial velocity in the y direction, which in this case we actually have numbers for 
8.66 meters per second, 5.0 meters per second. Okay, so that means the initial velocity is also good. So if we think back to the kinematics equations, um, let's see, final velocity, I don't really have any knowledge that allows me to figure that out at this point. Uh, or nothing in the way the problem was described tells me what any of that is. <sighs> so we could ask ourselves, um, how then does the kinematics equation simplify given some of this information? Remember, I don't like plugging in numbers unless they're zero. Um, if the number is zero, that can actually help simplify the equations. So let's actually look, actually, since I wrote it here, let's actually look at the final velocity vector and see if that allows me to write anything down. So that is the final velocity in the x direction, the final velocity in the y, di in, in the y direction. And that's equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times t. Which again, I can look, that's just a vector expression. I know how to add, add and multiply. I know how to add vectors. I know how to multiply a vector by a scalar. I could just write out what is the x, x line and what is the vertical y line. So the initial velocity in the x direction plus, and now we have to be careful, plus the acceleration in the x direction, which is not negative g, it's zero in this case. In this case, actually, it's just zero times t. And then in the y direction, that does have a negative g times t. Yeah, don't let gravity work in the horizontal direction. That doesn't make sense. So let's see, zeros are nice because that actually just makes this entire thing go away. So now I could ask, does this allow me to actually calculate anything? I know these Vs, I know the G, I don't know T. But notice that gets me part of the way. Um, that allows me to look at the final velocity in the horizontal direction. And actually I can already say something about what the final velocity is. Um, since I know everything on the right hand side, you know, a t did not appear, for example, because the acceleration was zero, all that says is, not red, the final velocity in the x direction equals the initial velocity in the x direction of 8.66 meters per second squared. Again, that's saying only what's going on in the horizontal component. It's not saying anything about the vertical component, which sometimes is positive, sometimes is zero, sometimes is negative when it falls back down. But in the, hor in the horizontal direction, it launches from the cannon at 8.66 meters per second, and at every point along the way, it remains 8.66 meters per second. Which again, is why the cart was able to catch the ball. They both had the same horizontal velocity, and that was independent of what was going on in the vertical direction. But notice I cannot say anything about uh, the y direction, fi the final velocity in the y direction, because it involves this t, which I do not know. Okay, well, we could ask then, what about the displacement, which relates to the initial velocity times t plus one half the acceleration times t squared. In this case, I'll write it out as a column vector. For the position, we said this was x final, and then zero was the displacement in the vertical direction. And that then must equal the initial velocity in the x direction times time plus one half the acceleration in the x direction, which is zero. And then similarly for the y direction, but instead of zero, it's negative g. And the zeros are nice because I can kind of just, can just get rid of this term entirely. And now ask, what do I know? What do I not know? I know this, I know this, I know this.
I do not know t, I do not know t, I do not know t. And I do not know the final position. So in this case, notice that the top line doesn't help us yet. Here, there are too many unknowns. There are two red question marks, so I can't algebraically solve for one and calculate one, for example. However, and I'll do it in green instead of red you know, to be more positive here. For the bottom line, we are good to go because since the right hand side only involves T, we know everything else and the left hand side is just zero, there's only one unknown and we can actually solve for what t is in that case. So the y component, the y component allows us to get t. So let's actually do that now. So if I just read off the y component, it says zero equals v, v naught y t minus one half g t squared. There's a t on in both terms on the right hand side. So my first step would be to factor that, fa factor out a t So I get something that looks like that. And now we have an expression that you might have seen in the math review. You have, you have two things I mean, I'll even put parentheses around this to make it clear. You have something which I'll call capital A, and you have something which is capital B. And essentially what this says is capital A times capital B equals zero. And what that implies, the thing to remember when it's set equal to zero is that Either that requires either A is zero or B is zero, or maybe both is, both are zero. If the right hand, if it's not zero, if it's not equal to zero, you cannot do this. If it was something equal to three, you cannot say that either A equals three or B equals three. Uh, it must be zero. Uh, so remind yourself of why of that if it has been a, been a second. So again, what that implies, if I look back at the original equation, that says either t equals zero or v naught y minus one half g t equals zero. Now this top line is just the starting point. t equals zero is when we started the clock, which it did start with the cannon launching the ball from the origin or where y equals zero. So it makes sense that that solution would also pop out of the math, you know, but that's not really the solution that we're interested in right now. So really what we're interested in is the second one, where if I solve that for t, this is t is two v not y over g. which if I plug in numbers is about 1.02 seconds. Now you might've thought, well, originally this looks, this thing up here, I could have said, well, that looks like a quadratic. Could I have just used the quadratic formula? Of course, you would have gotten the same answer. You know, the quadratic formula, remember there's a plus or a minus that you have to choose. Um, and if you used either the plus or the minus, one of the answers would have been zero. The other answer would have ended up being 1.02. Uh, but when you can factor, usually that makes things way more straightforward. And I think this was when we did the unit section in class. This was one of the examples I gave to justify that this has units of time. So velocity divided by acceleration. Velocity is length per time. Acceleration is length per time squared. 
that is length per time, I flip the denominator and multiply them t squared over l. It looks like some l's cancel, one of the t's cancel. Indeed, this has units of time as it must. Oh, that was a lot of work. Are we done? No, because remember the idea is that we were looking for displacement. How far? We well, we, I guess we answered half the question. How long was it in the air? About a pinch over a second. And now how far did the ball travel in the horizontal direction? Now if I go back, notice and it's conveniently still on the screen, if I go back to this expression here, now it's a little bit easier to deal with because now I actually know what t is. Uh, I can turn that red question mark into a, into a green check. And so then I can just plug in v and t to get x. So in that case, then x final equals v naught in the x direction times t. And if I plug in numbers there, I get that this is something like 8.84 meters. And we've completed the problem. Uh, I should even, I could even be more specific. It's plus 8.84 meters because it moved to the right. So now it is in the positive region of the coordinate system. Now the problem did not ask for it, but we could also have figured out the final velocities as well. And maybe I'll leave that to you, uh, but I'll write down the answer for you. So the final velocities in this case um, now that you know everything you need to calculate it, well, we did the first one already. It was the horizontal, the horizontal motion was 8.66 meters per second. And if you calculate the final velocity, you should get negative five meters per second. So again, solving these problems are really no more than just doing the 1D problem a couple times. Uh, and sometimes you have to combine components from different, uh, you know, the x and the y directions. But physically, you just have to remember that each dimension is operating independently of one another. Don't let acceleration in the y direction do anything about what's going on in the horizontal direction, for example. And you can see that too. Um, if you were to say, if we were to do the projectile problem, we kind of saw that, let's see how good it was actually. We kind of saw that when we looked at this, um, if this was a strobe uh, image, you could imagine each of these images are being taken at, you know, they're being separated by the same amount of time that there's the same delta T between adjacent images where you can see that there's some horizontal motion where it doesn't seem like the separation in the horizontal direction is changing, though obviously the difference in the vertical direction does change. They're kind of bunched up here because the vertical velocity is small compared to when it bounces and rebounds, for example. You know, a simple version of that is I could just launch a cannon and I just take a strobe light, you know, at some, at some increments of time, you know, it starts here. Um, it might, uh, let's see what am I trying to do here? It might rise up, rise up, rise up, then start to fall back down. And if you wanted to look at individual displacements, the displacement here, assuming I do this okay, should be the same as the displacement there should be the same as this displacement, should be the same as this displacement, and should be the same as this displacement. All these delta x's, etc. should all be the same kind of distance. Because um, again, the, your velocity, you're experiencing no acceleration in the horizontal direction, so your horizontal velocity cannot change. Again, think back, what does acceleration represent? represent Acceleration represents how velocity changes. If there's no horizontal acceleration, there is no change in the horizontal velocity. 
Therefore, the horizontal velocity remains a constant. Um, with a constant velocity, then distance is just velocity times time. These increments of delta x are all the same. As opposed to in the vertical direction, where the displacements between adjacent points is clearly different. There's a large displacement at first, then it gets smaller, then it gets even smaller, then it gets it's the same but kind of flipped, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets bigger. And that again is a result of the fact that the velocity is changing uh, because of the acceleration due to gravity. And if I were to plot this, if I were to plot my trajectory, maybe it looks something like this. If I were to plot, say, the velocity and the acceleration at several points, the acceleration is easy. There's nothing in the horizontal direction, there's only gravity pointing down, and that is always the same 9.8 meters per second squared. So I could write the acceleration vectors as just vectors of length 9.8 meters per second squared pointing straight downward in that case. Versus velocity, which has some value that is tangent to the position, it moves, uh, it changes direction because of the acceleration, it changes length because of the acceleration, Sometimes it's pointing kind of upward to the right. At the very top, it's pointing straight to the right. And think about that. Think why is the velocity in this case not exactly zero at the top? When we did 1D motion, the velocity was exactly zero at its highest point before it started to fall back down. Now I'm saying when there's 2D motion, the vertical velocity is not identically zero where it reaches its highest point. Of course, the thing to remember is there are now two dimensions to consider. We'll think about that for our, in our in-class problems as well. All right, and again, I will just be doing a bunch of problems uh, in the next lecture. So if you want to head out, you can head out. Uh, this next one is going to be, this next little part is optional. So I've been drawing all of these paths And I've been drawing them like parabolas. And was that, am I doing that just because I like parabolas? No, it turns out that we can actually show that the path that is followed is indeed parabolic in shape. So what, what does that mean? We want to show that y, if I write it as a function of x instead of, um, instead of time, that y is something like uh, you know, like alpha x squared plus beta x plus, you know, gamma or something like that. Um, that I can write it that the, the height is some function squared of the position. That would then make it clear that if I plot it as y versus x, that I would get something that's parabolic in shape. This actually is not too hard to do. Um, so if I, I can actually do it just by looking at the displacement um, expression. So I'll assume it's launched with some initial velocity, uh, which, ha which is done at some angle. So I'm assuming that the initial velocity vector might look something like something like that. There's some horizontal component, there's some vertical component that's based on the speed, which is the magnitude, and the angle at which it was launched. And again, I'm assuming free fall so that there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, but there is in the vertical direction.
plug that into this displacement expression. Oh, and let's assume Let's assume we start at the origin, uh, which means then we can just write the displacement as just x comma y, the final positions in both the horizontal and the vertical direction at some later point in time. So in that case, if I look at these uh, displacements, um, I can write it as, actually I won't, I won't recopy it, I'll just draw it, write it as vectors. This just means x and y equal um, just the initial velocity cosine times t. And this is the initial velocity sine of t minus 1 half g t squared. Getting the initial velocity, but now I'm writing it I'm writing it all out, and then the vertical component has an acceleration. The top line allows me to write down t as a function of x v and cosine. And now essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to now plug that in to the other expression. So I have y equals v naught sine theta of t, but I just wrote that t is x v naught cosine minus one half g, now t squared, but instead of t squared, I will write it as, I will write it using the uh, expression we had from the previous equation. And now the idea, I mean, I could probably just claim we're done now because you can kind of see that the highest term is x squared, so this is indeed a parabola. But we could simplify it a little bit more too. For the first term, there's a v on the top, a v on the bottom. Sine divided by cosine is tangent, so this is the same thing as tangent of theta times, oops, x. And nothing simplifies on this term, so I would write this as minus, and then it looks like I have a g in the numerator, a 2, a v naught squared, and a cosine squared in the denominator. And that's all being multiplied by x squared. So you can justify my algebra there. And since this is x squared, and that's the highest power of x, indeed, this is a parabolic shape. The actual trajectory that's followed is parabolic. And that is true regardless of how the object is launched and lands we looked at the example where it kind of started and ended at the ground. So it looked like this. So it did kind of look like a full kind of cup of a parabola. But it could be the case where say I launch something from the roof and I do it just by pushing it off the edge in the horizontal direction. In that case, the path will look something like this. And that path is still parabolic. It's still, but in that case, it's just essentially the right half of the parabola. It could be the case where I launch something into the air, but I'm standing on the roof of a building. You know, it, could, it might look something like this. And again, it would be still parabolic, uh, even though it's not you know, it's not a symmetric parabola, but the shape is still parabolic. Or similarly, perhaps I'm launching something from the ground onto the roof. You know, it might look something like that, which again, it would still be a parabola. Uh, just where you start and end might change. And in all of these cases, I have, I have kind of that highest point being reached you know, it could be that I just launched something at the building, 
but it doesn't quite turn around yet. That part that gets drawn out, it's still shaped like a parabola, such that if the building weren't in the way, you know, it would draw out to something that still looked like a parabola. But it ran into the building, and then that changed the path, obviously. Alrighty, very good.